one of the habitats that we've got in the carbon landscape and uh, the Wigan end, so we've got grasslands um, and the question is what to do with grasslands. You can either graze them, which we do at Lightshaw, or you can cut them for hay. So this is looking at what happens when we cut hay meadows and the progression of that process and um, seeing how we would develop them. The thing about hay meadows is they make mosslands look common. There are now only two in lowland Lancashire one of which is failing and the other one is relatively small. In Wigan we are lucky now to have got 70 hectares of beautiful hay meadow like this one up on the slide. So they were planted in, in the 1980s as part of the restoration on the post-industrial shale from the coal fields. So we've got uh, Amberswood, uh, Low Hall, Kirkless and the Wigan Flashes and they're part of a much wider area of conservation um, and they're part of a very broad spectrum of interplaying habitats across the whole of the uh, landscape. Um, the area was sown with a seed mix in the 1980s which included annual uh, cornfield weeds such as corn poppy and corn flower and these were put in to sort of set the grass and make the uh, set the soil make it so it didn't blow around so it didn't wash away which was a bit vital as well as that there was a grass mix which is fairly typical of a hay meadow um, and using the same system as Paul was doing in his Boston talk, the hay meadow is called an MG5 grassland, which is mesotrophic grassland of the hay meadow type. And that seed was basically put into the mix. Now in the 1980s, this was really cutting edge type of conservation. And there will be references in the talk to things that went slightly wrong. And Wigan was right at the front of this conservation. So any comments are really not meant to be negative. It's just that people wouldn't do it the same way now. So in the 1980s, there was this big hang up about uh, lack of phosphates and nitrates in the soil. And they were convinced that the soil wouldn't grow grass and vegetation. Um, and so they packed the seed mix full as well of the MG5 grassland hay meadow species and the annual plants which were to set the soil and show the site was being managed. They put in lots and lots of coarse legumes so it was absolutely heaving with red clover and a big tall about a metre high plant called yellow melliot and yellow melliot is an absolute pain in the neck when it comes to trying to get the grass to develop as a hay meadow afterwards. So um, you wouldn't, in, wouldn't put this in anymore, it's a, it's a, it makes life difficult. And as it happens, the system in the meadows starts to develop without it. So you, it's not something we'd do, but there will be references to the problems that the melliot has caused. So there we have the area um, with, the, with the grasslands. And that's what we're trying to achieve. That's a Wigan hay meadow. And there are now 20 hectares at the Wigan Flashes and a similar amount at both Kirkless and Amberswood. Um, and what we do is we cut them annually in September, August, September time to get a hay crop. And the hay crop is sold um, not at very much money but at least it's coming into conservation to a local farmer which uses the hay for feeding cattle. Um, we determine the exact date of the hay cut by putting a knapweed flower in our knapweed seed head in the palm of our hand, rubbing it round with a finger and seeing when the seed drops because what we want to do in our conservation efforts and hay meadow management is to maximize the amount of seed drop into the meadows. So in effect we're setting our entire process and hay cutting to farm nice hay meadow species in the grassland. Um, 
a cattle farmer would probably cut about four weeks earlier but then we would lose some of the species but ecologically it's important that we set a constant date so that all the species drop the seed at the same time and that everything gets used to it in the meadow because all the plants in the, in the field have actually got to change genetically to hit the sort of meadow time that we are cutting so it gives a chance for the composition to botanically develop um, within the within the meadow in 2005 we introduced a species called yellow rattle which is Rhinithus minor. Um, it was in the original seed mix but it's a hemiparasite on grass species and obviously if you include the, se uh, the seed of Rhinithus uh, yellow rattle in the, mi in the original mix there are no grasses for it to parasitize so it neatly failed to develop and strangely you still find Rhinithus included in meadow mixes and until the meadow mix is actually developing um, the Rhinithus, the, the yellow rattle won't, uh, won't uh, have anything to grow on so you have to introduce it later um, subsequently we've had a lot of recruitment about one species a year of MG type MG5 type uh, uh, flowering plants or grasses and these have included various dactylorhiza and marsh orchids and bee orchid so some really quite nice and attractive plants have come in um, so there we go you can see in that picture just how diverse the meadow is so um, this is a talk that I helped, I gave to the university so at the grass at the grassland conference so I have to explain how it, we did the work you can see we've got this is the Wigan flashes with the canal and there's Scotman's to the left, Turner's Flash to the south. And there are five meadows, and they're all rather nice. They're all in the, the round about five hectares each. And there's a control area, which was too small to actually develop as a meadow. So we've actually got a area that we can see the difference between if you cut the meadows and you manage them, and one where you... Uh, you don't. So what do we have that are, makes up a hay meadow? So we want the reduction of weeds. You don't want loads of dock and bramble and other coarse species. They aren't typical of a hay meadow. You want to have a nice amount of species diversity. So around about 23 species per meter. And you want a, a high number of flowering plants so you want things like plantain and clover and things that are flowering um, it doesn't want to be a dense grass mix um, you want to have a decent number of species so around about 12 to 38 is typical of an mg5 grassland that's hay meadow you don't want too much bare ground you want a sward height of around about 8 inches or 14 centimetres and obviously the site would be in a management plan. In 1999 when I arrived um, there were very few species because it was all the sort of species that you'd find alongside a railway embankment so lots and lots of tall grass, canary reed grass, yellow oat grass, bramble, dock, other things that are not very exciting. Um, obviously because of the amount of shade there was quite a lot of bare ground and it wasn't in a management plan so all in all not very exciting and a bit of a waste of good conservation land. And things like bees and butterflies obviously need the flowers. So it's not just about flowering plants. If you get the conservation of the plants right, you get a good number of insects and things as well. And then in 2012, and we've remeasured it since, we're now up to 21 species per metre. There are very few weed species such as dock and bramble in the matrix. An incredibly high number of flowering species 
So all in all, pretty exciting stuff. And of course, there's a functioning management plan. So that's what the grassland looked like back in 1999. Um, it's not particularly exciting. Um, and what we decided to do was change it over and start using countryside stewardship and higher level stewardship from natural England to develop the grassland. So we have went, did an MVC, which is to go and sample all the species in the field and decide what sort of habitat it is, look at what options. So again, similar to Paul and Market, looking at their mosslands, we've got those sort of things going on. Look at the amount of cover of the grasslands and the species in the cover. And what sort of soil have we got? So if it's too fertile, it's got too much nitrate, too much phosphate, it won't turn into a grassland. But anyway, they were so low as to be virtually unmeasurable. So um, that was great. And then what we did was leave a control area so that we can compare the changes that we've made. So there we go. For people who have a scientific bent, we have a look at all the different um, phosphates, calcium, magnesium, potassium, copper, zinc and lead, the pH of the soil, nitrates. It's, it's all been studied. And the amazing thing is it's all pretty good for making a meadow despite the post-industrial nature of the site. So, there we go, this is getting exciting, line graph time. So, there we go, starting with a species diversity, so that's how many species there are and the density of the mixture of the species. And in 2000, it was quite low. And the control hasn't really changed significantly, whilst the diversity in the meadows has nearly doubled since we've been doing the work and cutting the hay. And if you look at just the grasses, um, interestingly they increase, so that's one of the things, but it doesn't go up very much. But the forbs, they're the flowering plants, it's the posh scientific way of describing flowering plants. In the control site they stay remarkably similar, whereas in the, the flowering plants they go shooting up in the, in the uh, meadows that have been cut for hay. So you can see massive amounts of significant change there. So if you look again and you do it another way and you look at the amount of recorded species, if you look um, I'd love to get them point, but I can't because I'm pinned to the thingy. But the, the number of uh, species recorded in the fields where they've got the control stays remarkably similar. That's the orange box at the right hand end. Sorry, left hand end as you're looking. And the other species all increase. So we're now up to sort of fields containing 35 species, whereas in the control it contains 12. So you can see massive increase in the value to biodiversity of uh, cutting the field for hay. And one of the things again that's really obvious, there's what you would expect according to the guy who wrote about hay meadows, 40 species According to Mr. Rodwell, you'd expect in a hay meadow, the seed mix contained exactly 30 because they don't include in seed mixes all the sort of strange and weird things that sort of aren't pretty. So it misses out sedges and, and various sort of dandelions on stalks, uh, the horaceums, mouse ears and things. Um, but you cut for the hay and up, up goes the species richness. The number of recruited, that species that weren't in the original uh, seed mix, goes shooting up. Doesn't go up in the control though. And then the amount of non-MG5 species goes up at the beginning and then disappears from the meadow. And these are the species such as docks and brambles and yellow melliot, which took advantage early on of the 
process of hay cutting. When you first start to cut the hay, you weaken the weed species and the things that have taken over the site before it gives it a chance for the species that you want to move in. So there is always a little blip of sort of weedy dock and nettle time. You're just kidding me when I'm excited. So this is the exciting thing. You can see the red square and the little red dot in the sort of centre of the, of the image. That's what MG5 grassland hay meadow would look like on this particular graph. The red dot was what was in the seed mix. The 2000 is those yellow squares over to the left top corner and as you can see you sort of move gradually around the table and then yellow rattle was introduced introduced in 2009 and suddenly all the fields start to behave a bit like a hay meadow or two which means they've got the right sort of species and uh, physical characters and you see they're all clustered around what is a theoretical ideal so what we do know is that yellow rattle is fundamental to making a hay meadow, that recruitment occurs at about one species per year. Obviously heavier seeds are less likely to occur due to island ecology. Heavy seeds can't blow to the grasslands. So we might have to look at how to introduce those. And we work with Sankey Valley Ranger Service to actually bring some green hay in to uh, develop that. Um, so, and the diversity moves towards that of a hay meadow. There is that shift. So if you cut it for hay, you develop that, and you're strict with your development, you will get a really good hay meadow. And the great thing is that it starts to be indistinguishable in terms of its botany from any of the uh, uh, hay meadow um, locally. So you get um, all these species benefiting from the works and a reduction in fertility starts to mean you have a negative effect on the weeds which is really kind of good and you get things like orchids and the uh, species coming in which is grand and there's bee orchid um, growing at the Wigan Flashes. And the next things to look at is how to overcome some of the island ecology units, the green hay, um, looking at the fertilities now beginning to drop. Should we uh, add some farmyard manure just to keep the, the levels such that you would, because in a natural system that's what a farmer would have done. He may have grazed it slightly, but he certainly would have put some uh, light uh, coating of farm mind manure just to keep that levels up. Um, and then, you know, look at what are the benefits in terms of ecosystem services. How are we doing for pollinating bees and the like? So there we go. I'd like to thank Wigan Council for letting me play on their land and, and Wigan and Lancashire Wildlife Trust for not caring what I do. And <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.